And how do you apply for these funds? You can do it online um, at ewvcf.org. And um, we have uh, applications that are pretty simple. Um, We do a thing called trust-based philanthropy, a process that allows us to award the grants up front um, so that when you receive a grant from the community foundation, you'll get the money and then you just have to report back to us with a, a short um, grant report. And then what we've been doing, and it's actually worked real well, is we have Zoom meetings where the um, individuals who have received the grants for their nonprofit organizations uh, attend the Zoom meeting. Uh, we put them into breakout rooms with other people that are um, doing the same kind of programs, and then they can and compare notes and hear what has been successful. Um, maybe in Morgan County, somebody in Jefferson County will have some ideas that'll help the folks over in Morgan County. So these grants are for Jefferson, uh, Berkeley, and Morgan, and uh, they're for nonprofit organizations that are focused on these various causes. Very nice. Maria. So talk a little bit, uh, you know, for, and I know people are well familiar with what the Eastern West Virginia Community Foundation does, but if they aren't explain how the community foundation is a little bit different than the united big way dog, or, or big dog foundation <laughs> not big dog but you know what i'm talking about the big guys so and how how it works differently well first not everybody knows about the community okay foundation. there you go so it is a good opportunity to kind of explain what we do um we were established in 1995 we're one of about 800 community foundations that serve their own specific geographic regions in the united states um we serve jefferson berkeley morgan and and we have affiliates um, in, in Hampshire. Hampshire and Hardy. Mm-hmm. And so um, we have, since 1995, um, worked with donors who have created endowments at the foundation per- specifically to support their favorite charitable causes in the region. Um, they can, a donor advised fund can make a grant outside the region, but I'd say that 95% mm-hmm. of the grants that we award are uh, awarded to uh, organizations that are serving our, our, our region. So um, we receive the gifts from the donors, um, create the funds. We've got about 270 funds right now mm-hmm. that have been established. We um, award uh, roughly a uh, little over a million dollars in grants and scholarships from those funds each year. And we um, invest the money that we receive from the donors, and then with the investment gains, we're able to make the grants. So we grant roughly four and a half to five percent annually from the funds that we have. That's great. And um, differing, of course, from either a family foundation, for example, the Steely Foundation, or you know some big foundation the weinberg foundation in baltimore like that right well the the main difference is we have multiple donors multiple donors and uh, where the the steely foundation dr um gwen steely and and her husband um roy Mm -hmm. created this foundation years ago um it is led by um adam sanders Mm -hmm. a great uh young man who is the president of that foundation and family members are the board right and they award grants just like we do the we we kid um adam because he doesn't have to raise money in order to uh, to provide the services that right. they do they basically give money away and mm-hmm. we, we we tease him that that's uh, we have a meeting with him and with penny porter at united way uh every other month and um penny and i complain wine and whinge about the fact that um It's unfair. Adam only has to just give money away. But he does a great job doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful foundation. And people often, when they have $40 million, they'll create their own private foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you'll have donors like um, Randy Smith, who gave us $5.9 million Mm -hmm. and created a fund within the foundation. And he has a donor advised fund that he makes recommended grants from every year. And so projects like the W. Randy Smith Recreation Center down in South Berkeley were built um, with funds from his fund at the Community Foundation. That's a great story as to how that came about. I'm sure you know it, Michael, but I was talking to Steve Catley one day on the program when he was in charge of Parks and Rec. And he had mentioned the fact that 
Randy's grandson said it'd be nice if we had a facility in the southern end of the county so that we didn't have to go all the way up to the 2000 rec center for games and whatever. And uh, Randy went, hmm, I, you know what? I could actually build that. Yeah, he could. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> he did. Now, his grandson was, I think, in his final year of high school when it was completed. So it Still, wasn't, <laughs> takes but, a little bit of time yeah, to, make things, to make things happen. It's a big but, building. Yeah, it is. So yeah, it is. I, I'm, you know, extremely impressed. Uh, I, I will say it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, I was unfamiliar with your organization before um, yesterday, but... Um, just looking at the work that you guys do, it seems like that regional aspect helps you tackle real problems that are, are pertinent to us and maybe not, you know, the entire national realm. I know that you guys focus on like literacy and like the opioid, you know, crisis. And uh, are there some other things that, you know, you're really proud of that are local problems as opposed to uh, more federally? Absolutely. Know, more um, and, and that's one of the things that uh, attracts donors to the foundation. Just mm -hmm. the fact that they know that we have local people um, running the foundation. There are four of us currently on staff, myself. Um, and then I've got Amy Pancake as the affiliate director working in Hampshire and Hardy County. Karen Hammond Dunn is our scholarship uh, director. And then we've got Rebecca Knight, who is our office manager but also our grants manager and our administrative assistant. So um, we've got a great team and we do um, get to know the nonprofit organizations in the area and we work closely with them to make sure that they um, are able to tap into the resources that we have. Yeah, that's awesome, that's cool. incredible. Michael Walton, our guest, the executive director of the Eastern West Virginia Community Foundation. Uh, Michael, how many different organizations or people will the Community Foundation affect this year? Well, in, re in regards to specific uh, scholarship donations, so, yes. Well, so uh, as far as scholarships, we will award about a hundred scholarships this year. Um, I think we had ninety, eighty-eight or ninety students that received scholarships last year. Um, as far as grants, we probably will, will award a couple hundred grants, and the grants range anywhere from. Uh, a, well, we have the many grants to teachers that we're going to bring back this year, and they are up to $500. Um, they're very small, one-page applications that teachers can submit in uh, early September and have some uh, funding for little projects that they can't get funded otherwise. And then they go up to $20,000. We've got uh, the Solomon Fine Memorial Fund that awards a $20,000 grant every year, and we're about to make that announcement soon. So how did you deal with, and I know we've talked about this on the air before, but new listeners all the time, uh, how did you deal with the downturn in the stock market this past year, which was a pretty nasty one? It was. It was bad, and we haven't gotten the final figures for December, but it appears that we're probably down about 14% from our high of uh, December in 2021. Um which sounds awful, and it is, but when you think that we were up 13% um, in 2021 and almost 20% in 2020, we're still well above historic dollar value of the funds. And the other thing is we received about $2 million in gifts last year, so we didn't have to sell anything. So the losses are all paper losses, basically um, saying that it, as long as we don't have to sell an investment, we still have the chance to regain the, the losses that were there. And you use some type of rolling average of a certain number of years to figure out how this all works? We do. Um, we award our grants based on a 20-quarter rolling average, so it's five years. We look at um, each quarter, and we average those out, and the, the grants are, the, the distributions are made on 45 or 5% of that 20-quarter average. So it does level out the peaks and valleys of the market returns. So a 14% loss in the market funds from last year doesn't equate to a 14% reduction in grants given out. Correct. Yeah, that is correct. Um, we we anticipate that we'll probably uh, award just about the same amount, a little over $1 million in grants and scholarships this year. Does it work on the flip side when the market goes up 20 30% in a year? Does that uh, affect how much you give in that situation? It, it does, but um, not Dramatic. dramatically. And the reason, again, because of the rolling averages, what it does do is it gives us the cushion for these bad years so that the funds were well above historic dollar value. 
And that's really our goal is to try to keep everything up above the value that we were given, the, the amount of money that we were given, so that we can keep doing this in perpetuity. The idea is to be able to uh, continue operating uh, long after all of us are gone. I think one of the one of the great stories of the Community Foundation is the stories that you tell mm. um, on your Facebook page, on your website, especially the scholarship pieces. I mean, these are really life-changing um, awards yeah. that you all make, and the the people who receive, the, the recipients just are, are so grateful and are able to do something that they probably would not have been able to um, without the help of some of these um, scholarships. Well, thank you, Maria. It is uh, very rewarding. And one of the great things, about about eight months ago, when we realized that um, we were able to devote more time to scholarships because we'd received a couple of large gifts for scholarships, uh, Colonel Dennis D. Barron, when he passed away, mm. he gave uh, the lion's share of his estate to the Community Foundation for the scholarship that he had set up for the Civil Air Patrol cadets in West Virginia. Right. Um, it's primarily focused on the Martinsburg Squadron, but anybody who's in the Civil Air Patrol can uh, apply. And we've awarded $5,000 to three students um, each of the last couple of years from that scholarship fund. Um, we receive a fee from each fund. So most of our funds pay an administrative fee of 1% sure. annually. Um, scholarships, because of the uh, amount of work that goes into administering those, pay 2%. So with that 2%, we were able to move Karen from doing both grants and scholarships to focusing exclusively on the scholarships. And what she's done is she's reached out to what we call our alumni. Mm -hmm. and. We've gotten such great feedback from them. And we're not talking about most of the scholarships that these folks are receiving are $1,000 mm -hmm. or maybe a couple thousand dollars. Um, but it really makes a difference. It does. It makes a big difference. And they are very grateful. What mm -hmm. are some of the qualifications for to like obtain the scholarship that you guys have? So I, I'm sure that there's, there's a few. but There are. There's 42 different scholarship funds. Mm -hmm. And it's all across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have scholarships that are for athletes. We have scholarships for, that are for female athletes. We have scholarships that are for uh, people going to WVU or people going to um, Marshall. Um, we have a great nursing scholarship that is um, was set up by Hospice of the Panhandle. And it is for, what, what's really neat about that is um, the young lady who received that this year or, or 2022 um, was in her third year at Shepherd. So very few of our scholarships are available to students who are already in, in college. A program. Mm -hmm. And so this was great because it was a kind of a surprise to her. She received two different scholarship nursing scholarships from us, including the one from hospice. That's incredible, yeah. honestly. The investments, Michael, are they done collectively? Uh, all the funds are pooled, or are some of these uh, scholarships and, and funds that you have directed to be more conservative in their investments? No, they're pooled. Um, we have seven different um, local institutions that we work with. So they are all banks in the region. Um, they have either a trust department or a wealth department in their bank. And um, what we do is we have an investment committee that meets four times a year, and we have a, a pretty comprehensive investment policy statement, which provides um, is a, some flexibility to the advisors, but they have to follow certain things that we ask them to do as far as um, the mix of assets that they're investing in. What is your general mix in 65, terms of stocks? Yeah, 65% equities, 35% fixed income is pretty much the, the norm that most of them are in the range. So while the markets haven't been great, you can get a better interest rate on CDs and such now than you could before, too. You, you can, and that's something that we've looked at also because um, we have some pass-through uh, gifts that have been given to us, and uh, we could do a short-term thing where we're, we know that we've got that money secure and safe and uh, ready to go out when we, we need it in a six months or a year. So, yeah, the interest rates have helped a little bit. What's one of the more unique scholarship opportunities that you have within the foundation? Oh, boy, Karen should be answering that question for you. But I would say that um, probably as far as scholarships go, um, we've got one that was established um, at Musselman High School. It's the Jakes Scholarship, and um, it's for students in the top 10% of their class. Um, and it is 
very uh, very few restrictions placed on it. Um, but we get great applications from these students, and um, it's a substantial scholarship. It's five thousand dollars paid out over four years, so it's a it's a nice help. To, and we I think we do six of those uh, to Musselman each year, so it's a good one. Do you do you watch anything that the state legislature does during the course of the sixty day session that could directly affect you, or is the effect on you more at the federal level? Um, the effect on us is more at the federal level. Um, you know, we have uh, been looking at the qualified charitable distributions, the new uh, guidelines. So we get a lot of um, uh, gifts from individuals who are senior citizens who um, are required to take a, a minimum distribution from their IRA, traditional IRAs. And they can do that through a qualified charitable distribution and not have to pay taxes on it. it comes to us as a gift and we're not taxed on it so so during the trump administration they've changed the tax code and they made uh, the deductibility of charitable contributions uh, a bit more restricted in terms of how you itemize mm -hmm. as was a byproduct of that has that affected the contributions that you've gotten we do get some donors who bundle their contributions <laughs> so they will give us uh, maria knows this i'm sure she's got a few donors at hospice who do the same thing they'll one year give us a substantial amount because they're going to itemize their deductions yeah. that year and then the next couple of years we won't hear from them because they've already um, funded what they wanted to do in the way of charitable giving and I think, too, um, generally speaking, people make gifts because they're really important to them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the tax benefit is wonderful. Um, but by and large, we have found that most of the people who make gifts make gifts because they have a heart for the organization or for their particular cause um, that they're wanting to fund. So um, there's obviously some benefit to um, the tax piece, obviously, but by and large, I think most people give them because um, it's, it's an important piece of who they are and what they want to do. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, Maria. They are going to give to us and to you um, at, the, at the at hospice. If that's what they have in their heart, they're going to do it whether they get the tax deduction or not. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's right. Do you, do you want to share like a, a, I don't want to put you on the spot, but share a success story or something that, you know, personally really touched you that... Uh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, that was a perfect segue because I was going to say there's another thing I'd like to talk about. <laughs> so in October, we received a call from a gentleman named Richard Tyler. And he said, um, I don't know if you know this, but my uncle died and he left you his house. Um, so uh, he, Richard. Those are always interesting yeah. calls. Really? <laughs> How'd um, that happen? My first question would be me personally yeah, or the foundation? Yeah, right, the, the yeah. foundation. So I don't know if anybody knows Richard Durham, but Richard Durham was. I do. Yeah, yeah. He was a great runner. Great um, runner, swimmer, yeah, athlete. Very involved with the, especially the Jefferson Chamber, if my memory serves Yeah, he right. was from Shepherdstown, right. a, a real estate investor, um, started a fund for the uh, Boys and Girls Club of the Eastern Panhandle years ago, and um, had would come in often and just visit and, and I'd see him from time to time he'd be he out running or something. He stop in and say he hey. He loves to stop in. Yeah, exactly. He passed away in March. We found out in October and in his will it said and I give the house to the community foundation. <laughs> so we had owned this house since March and didn't know it. <laughs> So we went over and um, Chip Hensel, who is the chair of our um, gift acceptance committee, and I went over and looked at it. It needed a little cleaning up, um, but he hadn't been there for seven, eight months. Yeah. And, um, and so we're almost at the point where we're gonna put it on the market. And when we do, it will be sold and half of the fund will um, go to the Boys and Girls Club, half of the proceeds, and the other half is the Durham Family Scholarship Fund that Richard set up um, with a, an estate plan. So it's a very cool, cool thing. Yeah. And yeah, and a, and a neat gift and a neat story. And um, you know, th that's one of the wonderful things about the Community Foundation. We are able to take unusual gifts, not a, a, all nonprofits are set up to do that, so. Right, right. Because sometimes when people call you, you're like, hmm, 
I have a piece of property on yeah. the side of a hill in Shenandoah, and you're kind of like, okay, let's <laughs> let's go take a look. And yeah. Um, yeah, some are wonderful, some are are not as wonderful. Michael, great to visit with you. Thank you very much, Rob. Always a pleasure. 10 seconds. How do people find out more about the foundation? They can call us at 304-264-0353 or go to our website at www.ewvcf.org.